Yeah, I mean, first of all, can you believe that that's our youth band? I mean, that is absolutely phenomenal. If you don't send your kids to Ignite, really, they're the ones who are missing out. So good morning, everybody. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say good morning? Why don't you turn to your other neighbor and say annyeonghaseyo? <laughs> Sorry, I just got back from Korea, and so if I'm still a little bit of jet lag, then you understand why. Now, Real quickly, I, oh my gosh, if you are out there in the foyer area right now, this is the last time that you're ever going to have to sit out there because next week, let's make some noise for everybody who's out there in the foyer because this is the last week that you're going to have to do that. So um, next week, 8 a.m., like they said, they're going to have cold brew coffee. It's nitrogen infused. It's going to come from a keg, having a keg at church. Sorry, that's just kind of the church that we are, honestly, uh, 8 a.m., it's going to be awesome. I'm going to be all hopped up on caffeine, and I'm going to be talking like this the whole time, but alas, I don't have caffeine in my system right now, and so I'm already feeling a little bit tired, honestly. Okay, so here, we are right in the middle of a series called From Here to There, From Here to There, and really what we're talking about is we're, we're talking about who we are as a church, and we're talking about where it is that we're going as a church. Do you know why that's important to talk about where it is that we're going as a church? Because we're afraid that you guys might get car sick somewhere along the way. Anybody, anybody get motion sick at all? I get seasick in the bathtub. And do you know why you get seasick? You get seasick because here you're on a, you're on a boat, and there's a lot of turbulence, and it's topsy-turvy. A lot of things are beginning to change, and, a lot, and all of a sudden what begins to happen is that you begin to lose your bearings. So when you got seasick, what did your mama tell you to do? If you were seasick, your mama told you that what you needed to do is you needed to look out on the horizon. Why is that? Because in the process of everything that was ever changing, what you needed to do is you needed to focus on the one thing, the one thing that would never change. Let me tell you this, there are a lot of things that always change about a church, and there are a lot of things that always change about our church. In fact, here's the funny thing, that you are here today at Vantage Point Church because you like the way that Vantage Point Church looks today. Here's my promise to you, that we will not look the same five years from now, and that we will not look the same 50 years from now, and there are a lot of things about our church that are ever changing, and it's possible for you to get a little seasick somewhere along the way. Like, for example, you might be sitting there thinking to yourself, why are we always changing things? Why are we always changing service times? Why are we always changing kids' classrooms? Why, you know, they brought the donuts only to take the donuts away, only to bring them back. I mean, my goodness, what on earth? I'm feeling a little seasick here. I kid you not, I kid you not. Six months after we move locations from here to our permanent facility, on Sunday morning, there's still going to be people coming to the high school, and it's not because they didn't know that we moved. <laughs> it's because they fell in love with a seat. It's because they fell in love with a room. It's because they fell in love with a parking spot. And in the process of everything in our church that was ever changing, they forgot to focus on the one thing that they loved about our church, the one thing that made our church the way it is, the one thing that actually informs all of the changes that we make. They never focused on the one thing that would never change about our church, that although methods change, although, although looks change, although you know the way that we do things change, we have a tendency to focus on that without focusing on the one thing, the one thing that will never change about our church. And that's what we want to talk about today, one of the visions of our church. So, okay, this summer there was a great movie came, that came out that, called Finding Dory. How many of you guys have seen Finding Dory? Great movie, right? And I think this one phrase encapsulates it best, where you have little baby Dory, and she says, Hi, my name is Dory, and I have short-term remembery loss. Right? So cute. But if you know anything about the movie, it's about a little blue fish that has short-term 
memory loss. She can't remember anything. She doesn't know anything that's going on. And so what happens is that when she's very young as a fish, she's playing hide-and-go-seek with her parents. She starts counting, and then all of a sudden, she forgets why it is that she's counting in the first place. And then she ends up swimming off and getting lost. And all of a sudden, her parents are beginning to freak out, and they don't know where where she is, and they want to do anything that they can to go ahead and find their lost daughter. Okay, now you're probably thinking to yourself, well, Mark, what does a movie about a fish have anything to do about the vision of our church? Well, let me tell you this. Very early on in any church, when that church first starts, that church is a lot more like the first storyline of that movie, Dory's Parents. Dory's parents, that that church will do anything that they can to aggressively seek and search after that which is lost. They will do anything that they can to reconnect other people into a loving relationship with their heavenly father. But, 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 somewhere along the way, what begins to happen is that church gets a little bit older. The seats start to fill up. You know, the people of that church begin to have more needs. And all of a sudden, that church, unfortunately, begins to go a little bit more like the second storyline in the movie where it's all about life in the aquarium. And historically, Christians from the very, very beginning have loved to insulate themselves in a little Christian bubble Pretending like a world on the outside that hasn't heard about Jesus or a world on the outside who has not reconnected in a relationship with their heavenly father that they don't exist and they love to think that, you know what, you know, that it's all about me, that's all about my family, that everybody out there is saved, that they all have it. And here's the problem with that idea, and that is the fact that God has given you and that God has given me a mission. Would you say that word? Mission. That God has given us a task. That God has given us something to accomplish and that is for you and me to be fishers of men and not keepers of the aquarium. And yet somewhere, somewhere along the way that priority begins to shift, and that priority begins to get lost. I want you to think about these two statistics just for a second. It's interesting that within two years of a person coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ, that they no longer have any friends who are on the outside of the aquarium. That they, within the first two years of their relationship with God, they have successfully encapsulated themselves in a Christian bubble, so much so that they no longer have any friends, not acquaintances, but any friends who are non-believers. I want you to think about this for a second, that a survey was done of nearly a thousand churches, and they asked them what the mission of the church in America was today, and 89% of them said that the mission of the church in America is to take care of me and my family. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the Great Commission turns into nothing more than a great suggestion where God tells us to go and reconnect people in a relationship with their Heavenly Father. And you know what we turn that into? What are you teaching my children? And what are you doing for me? And so that's why I think it's so important for us. We have a lot of new people in our church who've come recently. And I think it's important, so important for you as you make the determination whether or not this is the church for you to be able to not only see the periphery things of what what is going to change about our church in the first place, that is not going to, this band is going to change, this pastor is going to change over time, the building is going to change in the process of seeing all of the things that are going to change within the next 10 to 50, 50 years, it's so important to see the one thing about our church that will never, ever, ever change. If you have your Bibles with you today, would you turn to John chapter 1, verse 43. John chapter 1, verse 43. It, we, we do something here at Vantage Point where, would you all stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word this morning? John, 
chapter 1, verse 43. John chapter 1, verse 43, it says this. The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethesda. And Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Israel, the son of Joseph. Israel, can anything good come from Israel? Nathaniel asks. And this is one of the greatest things that Philip says. Imagine that Philip, there is someone who is, wants to know about Jesus. There's someone who wants to inquire about Jesus. All of a sudden, um, Nathaniel does not hand him a copy of Anselm's Curdeus Homo. He does not give him even the four spiritual laws at the time. He does not, he does not, um, You know what he does? He simply says this. Why don't you come and see? Hey, you got questions? Probably don't know the answer to it. So, hey, instead of just skirting the conversation, why don't you just come? Check it out. Got questions about Jesus? Come. God, come to church with me. It's awesome. You'll love it. Okay. So come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said, how do you know me? Jesus answered, I saw you while you were sitting under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I saw you sitting under the fig tree. Man, that is one crazy fig tree. I don't know what's going on under there, but I want a fig tree like that. You will see greater things than that. You guys can go ahead and have a seat this morning. I I, I don't know if you guys are this way, but I love learning about history. I love learning about the humble beginnings of of a... Something big, something great. It's almost kind of like, it's almost comforting for me. It's, a, uh, it's interesting for me to know that on the opening day of Disneyland, that it was an absolute mess. That, that people unrelated to the park were putting ladders up against the fence and charging people $5 to get into Disneyland. Did you know that? Uh, that in the very beginning of the Beatles, that there was a recording company called the Decca Recording Company that actually rejected the Beatles, saying this right here, The guitar groups are on their way out and that the Beatles have no future in show business. How would you like to be the one that rejected the Beatles? Talk about regret. All of a sudden, what I love about John chapter 1 is that we get a glimpse into the very beginning of a movement. You you and I see crosses and church buildings everywhere. You and, I, you and I know that there are Christians on every continent and every country in our world, which goes to show us that there is an unstoppable nature of God. Even when man and, and principalities and, and governments want to try and shut down the propagation of the gospel, they can't do that because God is unstoppable in his very nature. And yet, what we begin to see in this very thing is that, you know what, that Christianity didn't always start that way, did it? And we get a glimpse into the very first people that had ever started following Jesus. Why don't you look at verse 43 with me? I think 43 is pretty cool. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Why don't you say those next two words with me, would you? Here we go. Finding Philip, he said to him, say those next two words with me, follow me. Those, those four words are incredibly important. Finding Philip, follow me. Let's talk about those first two words um, to begin with, and that is this, finding Philip. Let me ask you this, who is it that found who? Was it that Jesus, was it that Jesus found Philip, or did Philip find Jesus? Uh, Jesus found Philip, didn't he? And I I want you to think about this for a second. No matter who you are, and today, even if you're a non-Christian and you're just checking out Christianity, maybe you're at church for the first time, so glad that you're here. But here's what I want you to understand. That whether you are an agnostic, whether you are an atheist who denies God and wants nothing to do with him and doesn't think he exists, and it's the most absurd idea in the whole world, and you have made it your life's mission statement to denigrate God and his followers as much as is possible, the heart of God is this, that the heart of God wants to pursue you and wants to know you ever since the foundations of the world. 
that no matter how bad you talk about God, that no, ma- no matter how, st- how much you want to strong him, God desires to have a relationship with you. That God is pursuing your heart. That God wants you. And for those people, for those people who have never ever been connected into a relationship with their Heavenly Father, the Bible uses this one word to describe their condition. That one word is right here. Would you say that word with me? That word is lost. (laughs) Say that word with me, lost. And here's what you have to understand, that, that if you do not have a relationship with your Heavenly Father, that word is not meant to be a derogatory term. That word is not meant to be a demeaning term. That term is meant to be a word that describes how it is that your Heavenly Father feels towards you. Because let me ask you this, have you ever lost a child? Uh, 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 last year, my family, we had the privilege of being, and the awesome blessing of being able to go out to London last year. And um, so all six of us, we went out to London. We went to the, one of the best museums in the entire world, the British Museum. So we were so excited about this. And at the British Museum, it was amazing. One of the best museums in the entire world. I had the opportunity to see the Rosetta Stone yeah, I didn't know what the road of Zeta Stone was either until I was actually there. But we were there, and I had the opportunity to see something called the Rosetta Stone. I got to see ancient artifacts from, from Greece and Rome and all these different places. When all of a sudden, my wife taps me on the shoulder, and she says, Do you know where Nathan is? Now, you would think, we already got like 50 kids, so, I mean, what's the big deal if we end up losing one? But all of a sudden, me and his mother just started freaking out. We were panicking. This was high tourist time in London. He did not have a cell phone. He had jammed the little tracking device that we had implanted inside of his forehead that Nathan was lost. And we did not know what to do. Now, some of you know what it's like to lose a child. And some of you know what it's like to lose a child. And here's what I want you to do first. I want you to bottle that feeling, if only for a moment. And I want you to understand this. That that feeling that you have is only a sliver. It's only a foretaste of how it is that your Heavenly Father feels about you if you are not connected in a relationship with Him. All those people that we maybe don't like or are an inconvenience to us. That is the way that God feels about them, even when we don't. You know, the neighbor that plays their music all loud and throws their crushed beer can over your wall. You know, the person down the street who doesn't even speak English. Muslim lady who picks up her kids right next to yours at, you know, at, at school. That is the way that God feels towards them. Okay, now, finding Philip, all of a sudden, Philip is found by Jesus. He has been reunited with his heavenly father. So what's the first thing that Philip did after that? Why don't you look at verse 44 with me? Verse 44, it says this. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethesda. And all of a sudden, now here's what happens. Philip found Nathanael. Here's the principle that I want you to write down today if you have a pen. If you have a pen and you're taking notes, go ahead and click your pen. Write this down. Because here's what I want you to write down. Are you ready? That found people find people. Are you ready for that? That found people find people. All of a sudden, here you have Philip coming into a relationship with his heavenly father. And what is the first thing that he does after that? He goes and he talks about his relationship with God. He introduces him to Jesus, doesn't he? Found people find people. Because what does Matthew chapter 4 verse 19 say? Maybe you've heard of this verse. Jesus is inviting someone else to follow him. And you know what he says? He says this right here. Come follow me and I will make you what? And I will make you a fisher of men. That as you come and follow me, that here is almost a condition of you following me. It is a promise. 
It is not hopeful thinking. It is not a suggestion. Jesus says this, that if you come and if you follow me, here is a natural byproduct that you know that you're following me. And that is the fact that you will become a fisher of men. Why is that? Because found people find people. That's just what we do as found people, don't we? And that's exactly how the story goes. And they told their friends, and they told their friends, and they told their friends, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so forth. That your responsibility and that my responsibility as found people is not simply to share a nice little Christian meme on Facebook, is not simply to check in at Vantage Point Church, which all that stuff is great and helpful. That your responsibility and my responsibility as find, found people is to talk about Jesus. Now let me tell you one of the reasons why we have to talk about Jesus. Do you know why? Because our Christian message is not intuitive. It is not an elevated form of mor morality. It is not a newfangled philosophy. Christianity, the very root of Christianity, has very little to do with the fact that you and I are to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. The very core of the Christian message is rooted in something that happened in history. But 2,000 years ago, there was a man named Jesus. He claimed to be God. He died on a cross, and he rose from the grave as a proof of who he was. That is the core of the Christian message. And guess what? You cannot, come by a, a, you cannot come by a historical statement by sitting under a tree and philosophizing, can you? If you want to know about something that happened in history, you must have somebody tell you. And that is our responsibility as Christians, to go to somebody else and in a tactful and in a winsome way to be able to share our faith with that person. Now, I know what you're thinking, because immediately you're thinking, like, uh-uh, I ain't talking about Jesus. Because maybe you're a new believer, and you think to yourself, well, but what if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? Uh, that's too scary. I don't think I can do something like that. That's a job of, like, a secret service agent Christian. That's a job of a pastor. That's the job of somebody who's more faithful than me. But that's not really my job as a Christian. When the Bible says that found people find people, you know, that is our responsibility. That is, that is a natural byproduct and overflow of what happens in our life. Maybe you are a more experienced Christian, and maybe you feel what I feel, and we think to ourselves, but the, but the nature of the culture that we live in is just so difficult that, you know what, with this whole idea of saying that Jesus is the only way to heaven, you know what? It just seems so rude. It seems so hateful. And it does seem hateful, doesn't it? Unless it's true. If it's true, then all of a sudden it may not necessarily be a, a tolerant statement, but it's the most loving statement that you could ever utter in your entire life. Here's what my mentor says about sharing your faith. And I absolutely love it because I'm scared of sharing my, I'm scared about talking about Jesus too. Here's what my mentor says. That when it comes to sharing your faith, don't think of sharing your faith as a sermon. Don't think about sharing your faith as even a paragraph. Think of sharing your faith as this right here. That it's about, sharing your faith is about dropping a positive word at just the right moment. Think of sharing your faith as dropping a positive word at just the right moment. What does that look like? What does it look like to drop a positive word? Maybe it looks like something like this. That when you see a sunset and you're with somebody else, when you see a baby being born, you know what you do? You say, you know what? Isn't God amazing? Period. That's it. What you're doing is you're almost kind of dangling a lure, like a good fisherman, in front of somebody. And if the Holy Spirit is working in their life, guess what? They're going to go ahead and bite. If they don't bite, then it's not your fault. What happens at that point is that just like a good fisherman, you go ahead and change the lure, don't you? 
What it looks like is this. Maybe tomorrow you're going to go into the workplace and you're going to say something like, hey, did you have a good weekend? What would you do this weekend? They're going to talk about, oh, how USC lost this weekend, but at least they lost to the number one. And, oh, UCLA, they lost too, but they didn't lose to the number one. And, you know, and then all of a sudden what they're going to do is they're going to ask you what it is that you did this weekend. You know what you're going to say? You're going to say this. I went to church. Pastor talked about making your life count for something. Period. You're going to see if they go ahead and bite. That's it. Pretty easy, right? And if they do bite, then here's what I want you to do. I want you to invite them to church. Just like the person in the Bible that we saw, he just said, come and see. Now, I don't have all the answers. I don't know the answers to everything. But you know what? Just come and see. Check it out. Hey, you want to come to church with me this weekend? I have a statistic that I want to share with you, and that is this, that half of the people that you invite to church at the right time will come. That half of the people that you invite to church at the right time, they will come. Now, 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 uh, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, you know, what are you talking about here? Can, Can I tell you this? That people are open to God, and they are open to God. They are curious about God, especially during transition times in their life. So when they start college, or when they graduate from college, when they get married, when they have kids for the first time, when their kids become teenagers, wow, when your kids become teenagers, you begin to search after God like no other time in your entire life. You know, you know when people are curious about God? When they have the cars, when they have the boat, when they have the house, when they have the vacation, and yet they still feel empty on the inside. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, Mark, let me tell you this. Uh, I don't know if that statistic applies to me because you must not know the same unchurched people that I do. There is no way that my unchurched friend will come to church with me. You should know, you should just see the kind of lifestyle that they lead. No way. And here's what I want to say to you. Let them say their own no. Never say no for somebody. Because when you say no for somebody, you know what you're doing? You're saying, you know what? You might as well go to hell. And this is what brings us to the very vision of our church. Let me talk to you about, in in light of all of the different things that always and will change about our church, let me tell you the one thing that forms the very heart of Vantage Point Church that will never, ever, ever change. It is the very root of why it is that we started this church in the first place. And that is because of this phrase right here. That we want to make Vantage Point Church, that we want, that our mission is to make the Inland Empire the hardest place to go to hell. That statement is what our church is all about. That we want to make a difference in our community. That we want lives to be redeemed. That we want marriages to be restored. That we want uh, teenage girls who are cutting themselves to find hope. That we want other students who come into a relationship with their Heavenly Father and yet still struggle with their sexual identity in this day and in this age to have a place, a safe place where they can actually come and talk about it. Where they can wonder how it is that they can process through all of these things in a biblical perspective. Let me tell you this. If your heart beats for that statement right there, that is how you know that you are in the right place. Not for you to say, hey, you know what, Vantage Point Church? Wow, they have such a great band. Because guess what? Chase isn't going to be here five, well, I'm not... 50 years from now. In the, in the process of everything that changes about our church, let me tell you the one thing that makes our church our church, and that is the fact that whether it's in this community, whether it's in our country, or whether it's in the this concentric circle of our entire world, we desire our church not to be a country club, but we desire our church to be a hospital for the sick. And here's the thing. If you and I feel like we don't have to move, it is only because we have grown complacent. Let me tell you why we can't stay here. 
let me tell you why we must keep moving. Why we must keep changing as a church. You know why? Because that statement that you saw before you has not yet been accomplished. And until that statement is done, you and I have no time to rest because God has given you and God has given me more than just a happy life to take advantage of. God has given us an objective. And if you and I stay where we're at, then guess what? It's going to be so easy to grow complacent. You know why? Because we're going to look around us and we're going to say, hey, you know what? Even if I invited somebody, there's no room for them to be here. So guess what? I'm just going to do my own thing, work my own life, mind my own business, and you know what? Everything will be fine. You, you know what? We, we'll, we'll go grow complacent because we see that the children's classrooms are full and the parking lot is full. And we might, as the largest church in Eastvale, I say that tongue in cheek because who cares? As the largest church in Eastvale, you and I might be liable to look around and go, you know what? I think we're doing something right here. And let me tell you this. I think we are doing something right here as a church. But let me give you a little bit of perspective. That we are a church of 1,300 in a city of 60,000. And that doesn't even include the Inland Empire. All that to say... I think we are doing something right. But guys, we can't stop. We got to keep moving. We got to keep growing. And we got to keep changing. So here's the challenge that I have for you right now. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take out your phone. Okay? Take out your phone right now. I'm going to challenge you to do something right now that there is someone in your life that God has called you to reach. There's someone in your life that God has called you to talk about Jesus with. And you, I don't even have to tell you who to think of because you already know who that person is. For me, I'm the only, even though I'm a pastor, I'm the only Christian in my entire family. And even if this church were to reach the entire city, if I don't reach my family members, I will feel like I have failed as a Christian. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to text my sister, and I'm going to say, Hey, Julie, um, uh, tomorrow is Labor Day, and we'd love to have you come over for lunch because mom and dad are coming over, right? I'm kind of like setting the stage here. But also, um, next Sunday is September 11th, and our church is doing something kind of cool on that day. And so we'd love for you to join us if, if you have time. That's the text that I'm going to be writing to my sister. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to get your phone out right now and I want you to text that person before we even leave from here, inviting them to come and see next week. It's going to be a great time, okay?